Good morning. Uh, my name is Stephanie Walters. I'm the head of the Peace and Security Research Program at the Institute for Security Studies. And today we're going to be looking at the latest developments in the DRC, uh, largely around the political accord of December 31st, and what's happened since we last um, caught up and had a briefing, which was in early January. There have been quite a few developments. We'll be looking at the impact of the death of Etienne Chisikedi and some of the other important developments in the DRC, notably around human rights and uh, eruptions of new uh, insurrectional activities in the country. So, so let me start, though, with where we left off last time. And um, we would had a, a conversation about the accord which was signed on December 31st. And one of the things that we noted about that accord is that, for all intents and purposes, on paper, this document is a very good roadmap for elections in the DRC. It had some um, key improvements on the October accord, notably its explicit language about Kabila not being able to have a second mandate. And the date for those elections was set for 2017. So I think it was really something that we all, um, as analysts, felt was a very good um, way to get from um, the end of Kabila's mandate to an actual election. Of course, we had concerns about the level of sincerity, the level of commitment of the signatories to that accord. And quite quickly, there were two key issues that arose that became the sticking points in over the course of January. And those were essentially the distribution of key ministries, so ministries like defense and justice and um, interior, who would get those, how would that be um, distributed between the different uh, players, the, the, the ruling party and the opposition parties. And equally importantly, um, how exactly would the prime minister be designated? So the accord um, does uh, make provisions for the Rassemblement, the largest opposition alliance, to nominate that prime minister. But exactly how that was going to be done isn't mentioned explicitly. And so the ruling party uh, was saying, we essentially want the Rassemblement to submit several names, and Joseph Kabila will pick one name and appoint that person as prime minister. Whereas the Rassemblement's interpretation was, that they would give Kabila one name and that person would then be prime minister. So that's where we were in early February, really stuck in this conversation and not moving forward very much. And then a very significant event took place. Etienne Chisikedi, who had been seeking medical, um, had, had a medical checkup in Belgium, died suddenly. He had been ill for many years, but his death was no doubt um, unexpected and very shocking. And it has completely changed the game in the DRC. I, I would, I, as I was preparing this morning, I was thinking, you know, the more we get away from that death, the clearer it becomes actually what a what a seismic event this is. Um, this this one person disappearing, and it's it's for a variety of reasons that I will I will get back to a little bit later on. But Etienne Chisikedi dies in early uh, February in Brussels. Um, in the immediate aftermath of that, there's a sort of dying down of conversation about politics out of respect for for his death. But quite quickly, the political games began. And the political games initially centered on where will his, when will his funeral take place? When will his body be brought back to Kinshasa? And there were elements of his uh, political alliance that were trying to use the leverage of his um, return, the return of his body, to get the formation of that government. Um, quite a distasteful sort of approach in many people's views. Um, but it, it's the kind of games that have erupted in the aftermath of Chisikini's death. Um, we have seen, unfortunately, no progress made on, on, on the, um, the nomination of a prime minister or on the ministries. And that's essentially, at this point, uh, down to the fact that the opposition has fallen into some level of disarray. So after an initial period of respect for the, for, for the family and for Chisikidi himself, um, the Rassemblement started to get together again and started to talk about who was going to take the position that had been vacated by Chisikidi, and that position is the head of the let's say, follow-up committee to implement the accord, a very key position which goes, according to the political accord, to the head of the committee of elders of the Rassemblement, which was a position held by Chisikidi himself. With his death, that position was vacant. So the Rassemblement had to uh, appoint a new person. And of course, also, who is going to lead the UDPS and therefore the Rassemblement itself? So two very important positions. Um, now being um, now back on the table, back in play, if you will, um, and I think it's important to remember that Chisikedi, you know, there's no question was the most legitimate, the most credible, the most long-standing opposition leader in the DRC. 
it's important to point that out because there aren't a lot of people who have that level of credibility in, in the Congo and who have the ability to unite uh, disparate um, and um, competing opposition groups and to create the Rassemblement or to create the kind of alliance that the Rassemblement ultimately became. Now, Chisikiri wasn't the only reason that we have this, for the first time in the DRC, a very sound and, and long-lasting, I would say, I mean, it's been about almost a year now, alliance. It's not the first time that we've had that, and he's not the only reason. There was a, there was a, a number, of, there was a rallying cause, which was the, the question of the delay of the elections and so on. But Chisikiri played a big part of that. And not just because people had respect for him, but also because the man could get the votes, right? Um, and of course, everybody who's in his alliance would benefit from being associated with a, a, a political alliance that would either win the presidency or at the very least uh, significant um, uh, seats in parliament when the elections are eventually held. So these are the kinds of dynamics that really were the glue in the Rassemblement. You remove Chisikedi from that um, uh, from that element himself and, and things have started to fall apart a little bit. And that has been the reason why over the period of essentially February and now the first half of March, we haven't seen any movement really on, on, on the key elements of this accord. The Rassemblement held a meeting last week. Um, at the end of that meeting, they announced that Felix Chisikedi is taking over as head of the UDPS. Felix Chisikedi is one of uh, Chisikedi's five children. Um, and he will also lead the Rassemblement, so the, the overall alliance, while Pierre Lumbi will be the head of the uh, Council of Elders and therefore also the head of the follow-up on the court of the committee. So he has a very key position essentially in making sure that elements of the accord are implemented. That's the job that Pierre Lumbi has. Pierre Lumbi is a man who um, is part of the G7. It's the group of seven parties that split from the ruling uh, party in the DRC last year. Uh, Lumbi himself used to be the national uh, security counselor, uh, national security advisor to Kabila. He knows the Kabila government well. He knows the majorité présidentielle well. Uh, so he's a former insider, um, and I think he's, he's quite a powerful figure for those reasons. Um, he also has experience with government, and I think that is important um, because the, the, the job of the um, person who runs the implementation of the court, it's almost like a mini prime minister. And I think it's really important that that person have um, government experience and experience with the different factions. So I think that's a, a, a positive choice in the sense that um, he, he may be able to, to, to wrangle the different uh, political factions and all the different um, ambitions that no doubt will be, will be coming up as we implement the Sea Court. On the negative side, because he jumped ship from the gov governing alliance, from the majorité présidentielle, of course, he's not a favorite of Kabila's or of his allies, and so there's a fair bit of animosity there, um, and that could be a, a slight negative. Felix Chisekedi um, is a much less known quantity. He hasn't had a particularly uh, notable career either in politics or outside of politics. He was elected as MP in 2011 for the UDPS, uh, but that was the year that Chisekedi chose to boycott the outcome of the elections. He, he, he declared it lacking in credibility and also declared himself president um, and instructed his elected MPs not to take up their role in parliament. So Felix Chisikidi was elected, but he never executed that function. Um, I think the choice and, and, and the verdict is obviously still out. This is very early days. Uh, we'll have to see how he handles things. In terms of him running the Rassemblement and the UDPS, I think it's a shrewd choice if you, if you believe that name recognition is important that there's some kind of continuity that he, as a son of Chisikedi, provides. Um, certainly in terms of uh, an electoral ticket, having the name Chisikedi and UDPS together is still a very strong brand, and that may have been the calculation. Of course, Chisikedi um, also will have, uh, his, his father did also leave him a bit of a legacy. He had appointed him as deputy of the UDPS last year, deputy secretary general. So it wasn't a uh, a, a sudden eruption onto the political scene, um, but he's nonetheless a quantity we don't know nearly as well as we know uh, as we knew his father. I think um, the next concern we have possibly about Chis Felix Chisikedi, there is still that question of who will the Rassemblement nominate as prime minister. Um, my view is that Chisikedi, Felix Chisikedi would not be a good choice precisely because of his lack of political experience and because he will be dealing with a cabinet that is composed of 
government people and other opposition groupings that are not aligned with his. So again, it's an extremely difficult job and it will have a highly technical mandate, which is essentially to deliver elections. So you need a lot of people to do a lot of things at once and to do them the way you want them to. And that's a difficult job for anybody. Um, but again, I would argue that that's a job that should go to somebody with expertise and experience in government. Now, we'll, we'll have to wait and see who the Rassemblement does nominate. Again, to just go back to that question, this question of how that person is nominated still isn't settled. We're back to that sticking point with the government. The Senko, which is the Catholic Bishop Conference that has mediated the December Accord um, and that is still very much involved in trying to keep all the parties on track and is still doing a lot of that work, very, very heavy duty work, has basically said that the accord is not explicit about the man, uh, how, the, how the prime minister is nominated and we expect the signatories to work this out between them uh, in, in quickly and in an efficient manner. Um, so it sent some rather stern warnings, I would say, are some rather stern messages to the signatories has, uh, and, and, and it's clear in the increasing number of communiques put out by the Senko that there's a high level of frustration with the failure to implement this accord so far. Um, Senko itself has come under some attack. There have been attacks of churches in parts of the country, um, and it has, it has essentially said, you know, we are not, we shouldn't be a target of any kind of political violence. We don't have a view on who should run the country. We're simply trying to find a workable solution between now and when those elections are held. So that's a, a slight deviation. Um, I do want to also add that the minute that Chisikedi, Felix Chisikedi and um, uh, Pierre Lumbi were nominated to those two posts, we started to have uh, noises about a split in that alliance. Um, Joseph Olenga Koy, who runs FONUS, um, and who's been around for a very, very long time, also, and who certainly um, has opposition credentials, but doesn't really have much of a base, uh, Joseph Olenga Koy has declared that he is the president of the Rassemblement. So we already have a split in this overall alliance. I think Olenga Koy, um, it, it doesn't really have legs, if you will. In other words, the legitimacy of Olenga Koy's split is not huge. Um, uh, Mouiz Katumi, the governor of uh, the former governor of Katanga province, has clearly stated that he supports the nomination of Felix Chisikidi and Pierre Lumbi. I think potentially we could avoid a complete collapse of the of the Rassemblement, um, even if there are people like Olenga Koy and others who are contesting the nomination. Um, but it's it's certainly delicate times in that alliance, and time is really the key issue. Um, I think the sooner we have uh, the government in place and the sooner we have a prime minister, the less we have a, a chance for the entire opposition to collapse. But it's 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 very much something that is that is a phenomenon. Some have suggested, and this has certainly happened in other in other uh, moments in Congolese history, that the Congolese government is in fact encouraging those splits, is potentially financing them. I mean, these are all, of course, um, possibilities. We've seen it in many other countries, and it's happened before in DRC. Um, but again, I th I feel like, and I've said this before, one of the positive outcomes of this whole election uh, confusion, if you will is that the, the, the opposition has become more mature, more varied, more geographically representative. It's been forced to become more professional as an opposition. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that now. And I really hope that we can, um, that, we'll, that, we, that that's the, the, let's say, the, the, the branch of the opposition that prevails as we go forward. Um, of course, for the, for the, for the ruling alliance, um, the analysis that we, that were the insights that we think, you know, we, we, we feel are, are correct is that they're quite happy. Uh, they're off the hook in many ways, of course. Uh, not having, they're not the spoilers right now. The spoilers are clearly the opposition and the splits in the opposition. Um, and so they can almost sit back and not feel uh, responsible for the fact that the accord hasn't been um, implemented. But I think that's a very narrow way of looking at it. We have other information um, with regards to how sincere the government's commitment is and I would point to just two things. One is the finance minister saying a few weeks ago that the Congolese government doesn't have enough money to hold the elections, which I think is a, it, it was a statement that was made not, not entirely out of the blue, but it wasn't really appropriate because we don't have an electoral calendar. There's no real agreement on just how many elections will be held at once, whether the presidential, the legislative, and the provincial will all be held at once. And the way this has always worked in the past 
and when I say the past, I mean the last two post-conflict elections, is that the government and the donors sit down and work out what the election budget needs to be, and then everybody comes to the party and puts in as much as they can. So for the finance minister to simply announce that he doesn't, that the government doesn't have enough money, um, is putting the cart before the horse because there are plenty of donors, and the EU said it again yesterday, and other donors have said it who will assist with the financing of the elections, as they did in 2005 and as they did in 2011, provided they have a clear electoral calendar. But it is, a, I think, a, a, a degree or an indication of the degree of the government's commitment and the kinds of excuses we may see coming up again and again as we head towards eventual elections. So that's the first um, um, element that I would say is not a confidence-building measure uh, around the accord. The second one, is um, essentially the deteriorating human rights environment. So we have two issues there. One, the, the court is very clear about the need for a number of different um, media to be back, to be react, to be opened again that had been closed during the protests over the course of last year. Um, there are also political prisoners who need to be, be released. Um, some have, but there are still many who are still imprisoned. Um, and there's an ongoing crackdown on freedom of expression and freedom of association. So that's one element of the human rights environment. Also not a confidence building measure. If the government wanted to show its commitment, it could very easily do that. It could make a number of very, uh, uh, not even just gestures, it could just allow media back on air, release political prisoners. That would be a confidence building measure in this time where we're waiting for this government to be formed. The second is, of course, and, and I'll return to this, but the second is uh, growing reports about um, human rights abuses by the security forces in, outside of cities, and the one big example has been in, 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 in the Kasais over the last uh, month, where a small militia, Kamina and Sapu, um, and largely armed with um, sticks and machetes, um, that's been operating for about a year there, um, has been met with lethal, lethal force coming from the Congolese army, um, and a disproportionate force, as, as some would, would argue. Um, the, the UN Office for uh, Human Rights has put out a report on this, and so, and so has MONUSCO, and they have um, condemned what they see as a disproportionate response by the Congolese army. Now, you basically have, um, and there are quite a lot of child soldiers or ch soldiers under the age of 18 running around without firearms, being met with lethal force. There isn't, there's their execution style killings, so very, very worrisome developments there. And I think between those two, um, it gives us a sense that there hasn't really been a, a, a significant shift in how the government is choosing to uh, to deal with any kind of opposition, political, armed, or otherwise. And of course, the Congolese government has a right to uh, respond to an armed militia, but it, 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 it can do that in a proportionate manner, perhaps by arresting people rather than um, um, necessarily recurring to lethal force. The consensus within the, within the international community, whether that be the UN Security Council, MONUSCO, or key donors, is that the accord is losing momentum and it needs to be implemented now. Uh, the message has been very clear, it's been repeated often. The same message has come from CENCO, it's also come from the, from the Vatican, which has been extremely involved in this, um, and it's coming from key UN agencies on, on human rights and, and, and other issues as well. So there is a very clear message, uh, this, this accord is the way forward and it has to be implemented now. The EU put out a statement yesterday uh, or Monday, um, that, that, that was interesting. Um, as, as you know, the EU has imposed sanctions on some key members of the security forces in the DRC as a result of um, uh, violations committed during protests. Um, it has basically said that there should, that no one, none of the signatories to the accord should be using any kind of pretexts to delay the implementation of the accord, which I think is a very clear reference to Chisikidi's death and the disarray in the opposition. It spoke specifically about the majorité présidentielle, the ruling alliance, um, and I think that that's smart because it's it's essentially um, a message to the Kabila government that we know that right now the ball is not in your court, but we, it will come back into your court, and we don't uh, we, we we wouldn't appreciate you again acting as a spoiler or using this as an excuse to backtrack. So I think it's it's a very clear message, um, and then. Also reiterating that elections must take place before the end of the year. I think that's another issue which we can talk about maybe in the question and answer period and also come to uh, in, in future briefings. But certainly the longer this all, all takes, the less likely we'll have elections at the end of this year. Um, 
the last thing I want to say is that, you know, the region played a really important role in, in I would say, urging Kabila back to the negotiating table between October and the December Accord, in particular Angola. I don't know how the region is going to respond to the current situation, whether it feels that, uh, that the government has done enough, has done what it should, uh, or whether it will, again, whether Angola will say, in fact, there's greater instability now, um, and we must, we must really go with this accord. So that's, that's a really big question that we'll be looking into uh, to try and understand what the regional dynamics around this, this, this current situation may be. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll leave it there.